Friends, let us call one another to the worship of the living God. The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us worship the living God. Friends, trusting that God is gracious to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness if we would only confess our shortcomings, let us pray together the prayer of confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen.
Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Welcome to worship, welcome to the Kirk, and welcome home. It is good to be with you, brothers and sisters, as one family in Christ, gathered by the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to welcome and say hello to those worshipers joining us by stream at Fox Run, Kirk West, this morning, and welcome to those worshiping with us on Facebook or on our website. No matter how you're joining us, we are glad to be in fellowship with you today. If you're visiting with us this weekend, we'd love for you to stop by the Connect Station in the hallway of windows is what I call it. Officially, it's the cloister. You can speak with Stephanie there uh, who can give you information about our church, uh, information about events that are upcoming, or or if you want to learn more about our new member classes coming in March, March 6th and 13th. Today, we continue our winter sermon series, Where God Leads. Where has God been leading us throughout? And today, Pastor Angela will be telling uh, telling us about how that faith is passed on, and I'm excited to hear what God has to say through her. On Sunday, March 6th at 3 p.m., Finding Home, a Lenten musical journey, please join the chancel choir and soloists and special guest Alvin Waddles as we share in an afternoon of musical meditation to begin our journey through Lent. So even now, we can get our hearts and minds prepared uh, as we look toward Lent and, of course, Holy Week and Easter. Today, following the 1030 service, there is a program called Digging Deeper. It's actually pretty neat. I got to do it for the first time last Sunday. It's everything you weren't able to fit in the sermon. Uh, So stories and and other thoughts and things you you wanted to put in the sermon but weren't able to get to. This is an opportunity for questions and and some good dialogue uh, with those who come. And there's also lunch, of course, uh, but you can dig deeper with your pastor. And today, of course, you can dig deeper with Pastor Angela. Also wanted to share, as we've been sharing every Sunday, our youth have an exciting summer of mission trips and conferences coming up. Uh, They'll be serving in Kentucky to assist with tornado disaster recovery and would also spend a week in Pontiac serving with ministry partners there. Uh, The deadline to register is March 1st for all participants. So please register online. Before then, reach out to Pastor Kelsey with any questions. Uh, Another announcement, today uh, Sunday school ends at 10.15. So just a heads up, it's not ending at 10, it's ending at 10.15. Uh, so I hope you're, uh, you're able to, uh, to, to find your kid <laughs> at 1015. Uh, please join us for coffee hour following this service for a time of fellowship. That's also a great opportunity uh, to welcome worshipers who are coming for the 1030 service. Friends, uh, those are the announcements. And now we have uh, Tom Bustance, uh, who will be sharing with us about congregational care, the different ways that this congregation uh, can serve you and support you, especially in challenging times. So Thomas Bustance, member of the session, will share that with us. Thank you. Good morning. As Evelyn said, my name is Tom Bustance, and I'm a 
an elder here on session, and I'm also chair of the Congregational Care Committee. And I'm here today to share a little information about that committee. Some things you may know, some you may not, but we're a place that you can reach out to in times of need. And the first, uh, we actually consist of five other committees. The first one is the Board of Deacons. The Board of Deacons, as you may or may not know, has 30, 30 deacons serving on it. Each one of them has 30 to 50 families that they, they represent, and they're the first line, really, of communications to the church. So we pray for the deacons, and uh, if you don't know who your deacon is, I would suggest that you would give <coughs> excuse me, Jim Keeling a call, who is the moderator of the deacons, and he can supply you with the name of your particular deacon so that you can reach out to them. The next level of ministry under the care, care committee is the uh, Stephen ministry. <clears throat> this is something that's headed by Nancy Lau. Stephen ministry provides confidential prayer that you can uh, go at after the service. We, I, I usually think it's over here uh, where you can meet with a Stephen minister for private and confidential prayer. The Stephen ministers are trained in 50 plus hours to be able to provide good, good prayer with you and walk by your side. The next one is the prayer cordon. They meet every Tuesday at 9.30 via Zoom and they pray for people in this congregation and also outside this congregation that are in need of prayer. These are people who are on a prayer list that's submitted by parishioners and others and each week we, we pray for those people at, uh, as I mentioned, 9.30 on Tuesday. If you had, know of somebody that you'd like to get their name on the prayer list, you can see Bob O'Hara. And in the front of your bulletin, you'll see it describes each committee and tells you the contact information for the head of that committee. The next thing are caring friends. <clears throat> I'm a caring friend for a couple people and we are always, always looking for caregivers to be caring friends for some of these people. Most of them are elderly and alone, and so we reach out to them once a week and just give them a phone call or send them an email, let them know that we're thinking about them, we care about them. Other times I've taken flowers to them or run errands for them. So it's a really nice way to stay in touch with people that are mostly homebound. So I hope if you were interested in being a caregiver, you will see it was Glenda Herb, but she's uh, stepped down for a while because she's doing the uh, 75th anniversary. So Helen Campbell, who was the chair of this committee last year, will be doing that. And if you want to reach Helen, just uh, reach me via email and I'll get Helen to get in touch with you. The last part of our group are the Soul Journeys. This is a group headed up by Ann Hartzell. There's a group of people on a journey through life's seasons of grief. This support group is for widows and widowers of all ages. And it provides a forum in which participants can share strategies of dealing with grief with others. So if you, if you are a, or know of somebody that's lost their spouse and would like to be a part of this group, please contact Ann Hartzell. And um, I thank you for listening today. If you didn't understand anything I said, you can read it all in the front of the bolt. All right? And uh, please reach out to us. We'd like to help, and we've helped, we're helping a number of people right now, and we'd like to help more. Thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless the Kirk. Thank you so much, Tom. And you know, when my, uh, my family uh, welcomed Eli, our son, uh, we had home delivered meals. And you know, I grew up in a Guatemalan household, so my standard for food was pretty high. So I was a bit nervous about what we were gonna get. And every single meal was spectacular. It was really just such a gift of, of hospitality. So we're thankful for that. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, the children, please. Come forward. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. Hey, 
hey. Oh, perfect. Nice, hello, good morning. How are you? Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Doing all right? Yeah? A little happy Sunday, a little thumbs up? Okay, cool. Well, listen, so today we're going to hear a scripture uh, in the letter to Timothy. It's by the Apostle Paul. You hear that name a lot, right? Paul? Apostle Paul, he's a pretty big deal, wrote a lot of letters in the Bible, uh, and they were very special letters where Paul gave the story, the message, the good news of Jesus Christ and helped us think about forgiveness and grace and the cost of following Jesus and, and all those things. And, and so um, today, Pastor Angela will be preaching about someone named Lois and Eunice. Anybody know Lois and Eunice? No? Ever hear that name? You have? Who is that? Who, who might that be? You related to a Lois and Eunice? Yes? Ah, okay. Anybody else related to a, a Lois and Eunice? No? How about in the congregation? Anybody? Lois, Eunice? Okay, a little more popular out there, I see. Okay. Um, I'm related to a Eunice. I have a cousin named Eunice. But today, yes, and you do technically, she's related to you too. So, um, and, and so, so Timothy, this letter to Timothy, talks about the grandmothers of the faith passing down uh, the, the tradition and, and, and sharing the story. And so I have a picture to share with you. Can you see that? This is my grandmother on my mother's side. In Spanish, her name is Consuelo. And in English, that would be Consolation. So her name is Consolation. And this is my grandmother from my father's side. Okay? Her name, we called her Mami Meri, short for Maria Germana. So her name was Maria. And both of them have passed away, uh, which is sad because, uh, well, it's sad, but I also know that they're at home with God. So I give thanks to that. But they taught me the faith. They literally taught me the faith. Mami Meri taught me how to pray. It was the very first thing she ever taught me to do. She taught me how to pray. I prayed the Our Father, which we're going to pray at the end of our time today. She would tell me about faith. She gifted me a cross. She bought me a cross when I was just a little kid, and she would explain it to me. And my other grandmother taught me uh, how to worship. So we would have these home uh, services. So she, it would be my grandmother and my sisters and myself. Sometimes my mom would join and we would sing songs and we would read scripture and then she would explain a little bit of the scripture to us and then we would close in prayer. Do any of you ever do that? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Do you do it maybe around the season of Advent? Do you do any Advent devotionals? Maybe around uh, the Advent uh, candles or around Lent? It's a great opportunity so your homework, I know you do, uh, your homework is um, this week, I invite you to maybe ask your parents or ask your grandparents to tell you something about what they believe. What is it that they believe about God? What do they believe about the story of the cross, of Jesus, of, of the church? What are we supposed to do? What does that mean uh, about the world? So many questions. And those are the same questions I got to ask my grandmother, Consuelo and Maria. I got to ask them about life and faith and church and Jesus. And so I hope you feel that you can ask your parents and grandparents the same. And I hope that they're able to tell you the story that has also changed my life. So friends, with that, we're going to pray and then close in the Lord's Prayer, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful for grandparents and parents who teach us the faith. Help us to listen and to follow in the way of Jesus. And we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. You can go to Sunday school now. As we enter into a time of prayer this morning, I'd like to echo what Tom shared earlier today, that we are a Stephen's Ministry congregation. And so please feel free to join a Stephen minister in prayer after the service. It's confidential prayer in the chapel next to us. I'd also like to remind you that we have a flower ministry. And so if you know somebody today who may need flowers to lift their spirits, please take a flower on your way out. You can also take one for yourself if you're in need of some encouragement today. 
Also, as we go into prayer, I'd like to lift up the following families today. The first is lifting them up in joy. We're proud to announce that the birth of Eloise Rose on January 26th. Her birth has made Evelyn and Frank Catacadmo great grandparents. Congratulations to the Catacadmo family. So our condolences to Kristen Donahue, who is one of our preschool teachers. Kristen's mother, Linda Kearns, passed away on February 4th. So private service will be held for her in the summer. It's also with sadness that we announce the passing of one of our Kirk West, our Fox Run friends. Robert Petrowski passed away on February 4th. A service is planned in April. And also with sadness, we announce the passing of Bill Robinson. He had passed on February 15th, and a celebration of Bill's life will be held here on Friday, March 4th at 11 a.m. Let us hold all of those people and their family in prayers as we go to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we are eternally grateful for the powerful ways you break into our lives. You show us compassion when we struggle to know the way, comfort and guidance when we feel lost, and grace when we mess up. God, your love pours out from you through your word and through one another, and we rejoice that we get to experience it so fully and tangibly. And while we sing your praises, we also recognize so much unrest. Cover your people with mercy throughout the world, in our country, in our community, and in ourselves. God, we pray for peace in this world. There are too many who are hungry, who have been separated from their families, who live in fear of the government, who have had to flee their homes to find refuge in unfamiliar places. While natural disasters continue to devastate cities and countries, we ask that we may come together for one another's aid. God, we struggle to find unity and healing for all people, and we need your guidance. Our country is not immune. God, we ask this morning for love to flow from our leadership and from one another so that we may be a country that is welcoming to the outsider and that stands up for the rights of all people. We often find ourselves divided and angry with one another. Remind us that together and with the rest of the world, we are your beloved children. Encourage us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. Lord, we also pray for our own community. Break down our walls that keep us from being vulnerable with one another and give us wisdom as we navigate seemingly never-ending change. Our church longs for your healing as well. So often lately we find our anxieties heightened due to times of transition and fears for our future. God, you are the head of this church and we so easily forget. Your way is true. Guide us through the power of your Holy Spirit to be a community that seeks first your will and overflows with love for one another and our community. And as we sit and pray to you this morning, we also come with our own emotions. We as individuals are experiencing times of joy and growth and also anxiety and loss. While our faith is not uniform, we know that you work within each of us to be your light in the world. Lift us up in our time of need and celebrate us with us when we are full of peace. Guide our steps, compassionate God. Lord, in all the ways that we struggle, we pray for your power to show us the way. We are so thankful that you work all things for our good. Fill us with the love and joy that can only come from you so that you may be known fully throughout the world. We lift all these things up to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Giving God, we give you thanks and praise for all your gifts to us. We know that you are the source of every good thing. Light and love come from you. You have created us and you continue to breathe life into us through the power of your Holy Spirit. You have given us so much and we dedicate this offering to the work of your kingdom here on earth. May this collection be used wisely and diligently that your love may be known throughout the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our scripture this morning is from 2 Timothy, select verses. Listen now for a word from God. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we have traveled a long way following where God leads in the last five weeks. We started out with Abraham and Sarah in Hebron, to Moses in Midian, to Naomi and Ruth in Moab, to the story of the prodigal sons, plural, in the Gospel of Luke, to Paul's last epistle in the Bible, which was written to Timothy. We have indeed traveled a long way. Thank you for the journey. And next Sunday, we'll conclude our series with Transfiguration of Jesus. Good place to end. It is, after all, Transfiguration Sunday, next Sunday. Please pray with me. Oh, Lord, open our eyes that we may see you. Open our ears that we may hear you. Open our hearts that we may feel you. Holy Spirit, come. We invite you here. Amen. I don't know about you, but I read uh, quite a few of obituaries, not for pleasure, but most of the time because I have to, to prepare for memorial, memorial services. What I love about obituaries is that they give us a snapshot of the person's life. Obituaries tell us what was really important about that person and how they want to be remembered. So here are some headlines from the obituaries of famous people over the years, and I want you to guess who they are. Titan of boxing in the 20th century, Muhammad Ali, a star idolized and haunted, Michael Jackson, the best kind of troublemaker, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the great figure who embodied man's will to resist tyranny, Winston Churchill, Evangelist to the world, Billy Graham, hope of the despairing, Mother Teresa. He died on purpose to avoid having to make a decision in the pending presidential election. No one famous, really. And someone who died in the summer of 2016, his children wrote that, just kind of to be funny. I'm sure we all know someone like that, even if it's not him. 
So of course, reading all of those obituaries made me wonder what word or words people would use to describe my life or how I would be remembered by others. What about you? What do you think people would say about your life? In today's selected passages from 2 Timothy, we see Paul's encouragement to his young protege, Timothy. This is the very last letter that Paul wrote as he awaited his execution in a Roman prison cell around 64 CE. Paul is at the end of his ministry, at the end of his life, penning final words to Timothy, his young disciple, a young pastor. In this way, 2 Timothy brings us to the brink of death, forcing us to consider its reality and how we might react when faced with death. Paul mentions Timothy's grandmother and mother, Lois and Eunice, and how they grounded Timothy in the faith. Those two ladies passed down their legacy of faith to Timothy, and Paul continues by saying, For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. For this reason. In other words, because Timothy has inherited the legacy of faith from his grandmother and mother, Timothy can now rekindle the gift of God and freely exercise the spirit of power and of love and self-discipline. What faith have you inherited that will allow you to rekindle the gift of God? We often say that faith is caught rather than taught. That certainly was the case with me. I cannot read this Timothy passage without thinking about my 85-year-old grandmother. And I know Pastor Edwin shared with children his grandmother and his great-grandmother as well. Was it great-grandmother? No, no, a grandmother on both the mother's side and the father's side, sorry. (laughs) And so we have our grandmothers and maybe great-grandmothers as well who have passed down their great faith unto us. My parents left for America a year and a half before me and my four older sisters, and so we were left in the care of my grandma, who was 85 years old at the time, for about a year and a half. I was the youngest of five children, and I was eight years old. And I still remember coming home from school and seeing my grandma. She would be doing one one of the two things, either reading her Bible or singing hymns. And I joined her in singing hymns. We would sing until it was time for dinner. We would sing hymns. Even to this day, hymns sung in English, they don't move me as much as hymns that are sung in Korean. And of course, I also grew up with my mother who would pray over us and pray for others as she was a deacon in her church. And so I would grow up with the prayers of my mom and prayers of my grandmother and the Bible reading and hymn singing and we'd go to church and we'd be singing hymns. And all of those memories have stayed with me and have built me up in faith. And then there was my uncle who would come to our house every week to help us memorize Bible verses, Psalm 23, Psalm 119, Psalm 139, 1 Corinthians 13, John 15. We would memorize them by chunks, by chapters, and he would grade us, and he would give us prizes, and it was so much fun. Growing up in that kind of environment, faith for me was much more caught than taught, and they have passed down a great legacy of faith unto me. 
And I wonder who are your Loises and Eunices? Who are the people who have passed down their faith unto you? Maybe your faith was caught in your household through your grandma or your mom or your uncle. Or maybe it was taught by your other households, the church, by your Sunday school teachers or youth pastors. Whatever it may have been, I'd love for you to go back and explore your origin, identity, and roots of faith because that will allow you to rekindle the gift of God, which will make you bold and claim and act upon the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Now that you have received this faith, how will you leave your legacy of faith behind? You know, I thought about how my two children, now 19 and 20, thought about how their faith looks different, very different from mine. They didn't grow up with singing hymns in Korean or memorizing Bible verses in Korean they did, grow up, they, they did grow up in the church, and I know they have some form of faith, but my faith that I grew up with isn't necessarily their faith. And I say this because I know that there are some of you out there whose children have grown up in the church but have gone on to college and have gotten married and have not returned to church yet. And you may feel that that legacy of faith never got passed down to them. But I don't think our faith gets passed down in the way that we think it should. Let's take a look at how bamboo trees grow. Yes, bamboo trees. You dig up the soil and make sure it's good soil, and then you plant the bamboo seed. You then faithfully water it every day. After three months, guess what starts to happen? Nothing. <laughs> you see absolutely nothing happening. So you keep watering it and watering it, but you continue to see nothing happening for one year, then two years, then three years, and do you know what happens after three years? Nothing. You see absolutely nothing. But what you don't see happening is what is taking place beneath the surface. Beneath the surface, a massive, dense foundation of roots is spreading out all throughout the ground to prepare for the rapid growth that the bamboo will experience. So you keep watering it and watering it, and eventually, after five years, I've seen nothing happening at all above the surface. The bamboo tree shoots up to over 90 feet tall in just six weeks. And the bamboo tree that shoots up might not even be your own children. It might be your neighbor or your friend from high school, or your Sunday school student. You never know what is happening beneath the surface and how the roots are spreading out over days, months, and years to create the connection and community that are needed for faith to grow and flourish in the lives of those you touch. God may have led Lois and Eunice to raise up Timothy in faith in their household, but God led Timothy to become a pastor so that he could raise up an entire community of faith in the household of God. Rekindle the gift of God and live into the spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Paul also goes on to say, but as for you, Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Sometimes 
we think our faith needs to be wild and exciting, and sometimes it is, but if it isn't, we feel like we're not living the Christian life, or at least not the kind that can leave a legacy. But Paul says, hold on. Hold fast to what you know and keep at it. In 2004, nine hospitals in Michigan began implementing a new procedure in their intensive care units. Almost overnight, healthcare professionals were stunned with its success. Three months after it began, the procedure had cut the infection rate of ICU patients by 66%. Within 18 months, this one method had saved $75 million in health care expenses. Best of all, this single intervention saved the lives of more than 1,500 people in just a year and a half. I feel like one of those videos where it just keeps going and says, this one method, and then at the end it doesn't actually tell you unless you click on something. Well, I'm going to tell you. Don't worry. Do you know what that procedure was? It was a simple checklist consisting of five very basic items, with the first one being wash your hands with soap. You might say, well, everybody already knows that. But that's not the same thing as everybody always does that, is it? Continue doing what you have learned and firmly believed about the power of Christ's love and resurrection and the power to transform the lives of people, including yours. I cannot end a sermon on leaving a legacy of faith without talking about Bill Robinson, one of the pillars of the church who joined the church triumphant last Tuesday. He taught Bible study for over 70 years and three generations of confirmation classes at our church. He never married and had no biological children of his own to pass down his legacy of faith. Yet everyone who knew him would wholeheartedly agree that he had taught the word of God to thousands of people and lived a life of commitment to growing people's faith and introducing them to Jesus. His legacy of faith was great indeed. When I received the news of his passing on Tuesday afternoon, almost immediately, I heard this ringing in my ear. Well done, good and faithful servant. In fact, I group texted those who were praying for Bill with the news of his passing by saying, we can hear Jesus saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Even at the session meeting that evening, I shared the same message well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. All night long, that line kept ringing in my ear. Well done, good and faithful servant. The next morning, I was forwarded at Bill's obituary, which he had written himself a couple years back, along with a very specific set of instructions for his memorial service. He had been ready for quite some time. With a broken heart, I started to read his obituary. It made me smile and cry at the same time as I read about his life and what was important to him and all his accomplishments, which there were many. And then I came to the very last sentence of his obituary, and I almost fell out of my chair. It read, and this is Bill talking about himself in third person, it read, his hope was when meeting his Lord, he will hear well done, 
good and faithful servant. It was a full-on God moment for me with heaven opening up and angels singing. There was no denying that God was present right in that place. And I realized it's not about what will people say about me when I die. It's not about what will people say. But it's, what would I hear Jesus saying to me when I enter into his presence? How have I been a faithful witness to scripture that is inspired word of God? How has my life pointed to Jesus? What would people say about what I said about Jesus? Would my last words be, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. What about you? What would you like your legacy of faith to be? What would Jesus say to you? What would would you like for Jesus to say to you? I hope and pray that we may live our lives in such a way so others can hear the voice of Jesus saying, Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. your Lois and Eunice. And perhaps more important question is, who will you be, a Lois 
and Eunice too. May you go forth from this place, know that you have an incredible legacy of faith to pass on to, to all those you come across. May you be reminded that you did not receive the spirit of cowardice, but you have received the spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And so go and rekindle the gift of God that resides in you now and forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.